Hi, Orla, Carmody, it's lovely to have you with us. Welcome to Shine Festival. Thank you, Tammy, lovely to be here. So I've been wanting to chat to you for ages because I've seen you speak in women in leadership events and in loads of different business forums. But I think that the way that you talk to people is so human and so accessible that I really wanted you to, to, to bring it in front of all the young women that we work with because they've got loads that they could learn from you as well. But the one thing that I struggled with, Orla, is your bio because you do lots of things. So I'm just going to ask you to introduce yourself and tell everyone what okay. you do. Well, these days I'm an executive coach primarily and I work with individuals or businesses in setting their goals and setting their strategies and working out ways of achieving them because we all have goals and we or we all should have goals. We should set things we want to achieve. But I suppose I came to that in a roundabout way. Every single thing I've done since I was a young person has been about communications because I really believe that how you communicate is how you persuade somebody to come on side, how you achieve any goal. So it is the heart of all good leadership. I think the best leaders are always good communicators. It's the one common denominator as such. So no matter what it is you want to achieve in life, you have to learn how to communicate and where does that start? But I started very young. Um, I suppose I think the moment I realized I could communicate was at a school debate. So, you know, you're 17 and the teachers line you up to do these, this debate and you think there's going to be, you know, half a dozen teachers in the room and that's it. And we went to debate against this boys school and for some reason they put the whole school into the assembly hall. So there we are, 16 or 17 year old girls on this debating team. And there is a, a thousand young lads looking at us and we're nearly dying. But I remember going through the debate and it was fine and it was going well. And it came to the end of it and there's the sum up. So the person who speaks first, as you know, also speaks last. So I was asked to do that job. And the teacher who'd set this up handed me this script and said, now there's your summation. And if you do this well, you're going to win. You're going to win. You're, you're going to beat the boys, you know. And I remember reading two lines of it and going, no. And I just threw down the script. I said, I've got to do this myself and I've got to do this with passion. And I've got to sum up everything I've heard from their arguments over the last hour or whatever it was. And I've got to nail this. And I just let rip and we won the debate. And that was the moment I realized I can communicate. And I've been doing that my entire life. So I went into a career in journalism, local radio, LMFM in the Northeast, where, where I now live. And then I went on to RTE. I spent a number of years in RTE as a journalist. And then I had my family. I have four kids and now young adults. And I took a few years out to be with them. And then by then, my husband and I, we'd set up a communications training consultancy business. So when I was ready to feed back into the workforce, I began training. So I was working with people on how to speak, how to present publicly, how to speak on the media, how to negotiate, how to chair a meeting, all those key communications pieces that, as I've said, are, are really so central to everything you do in the world. And then we, we broadened that out to leadership development and I developed a huge interest in diversity and inclusion and working with women. Um, and it's kind of evolved, but as I said, every penny I've ever earned in my entire life has been through communications in some form or other. Yeah, I completely agree with what you're saying. It's one thing that I've always said is that the one thing that we all have is our own story and nobody can ever take that from us. And to be able to tell your own story is such a unique gift, you know, because it's how we relate to each other. It's how you form relationships. Um, so communication is such an important part of everything that we do here. So I've loads that I could talk to you about. And, you know, as I said, you're somebody that I really struggle to find a topic because I know you've got so much um, expertise. But let's start with strategy, right? Because when you run a business, people say that you need to have a brand and you need to have a strategy, right? And I think and I believe that we should all have one for ourselves as well, you know, that we should figure out a strategy for ourselves and set goals for ourselves. So can you explain to me what is a strategy and should we all have one and what would that look like for us? OK, as we get further up the career ladder and further along in terms of our study and whatever, the strategy becomes clear to us. It might be about getting a job. It might be about getting a degree, going on and getting a master's. It might be a lot of things like that in the short term. But for very young women uh, participating with us here today, what I really want to say to them, this short term strategy, and back to my, my drum that I beat, is learn to find your voice. 
and find that voice whatever way you find it and use it as actively as you can. So you have to find your physical voice in the sense of learning how to put up your hand and express an opinion, but then you've also to learn what that voice might be and what that opinion is. So if you look at somebody like uh, Greta Thunberg and you know, she has found her voice and she's found her arrowhead. I call it your arrowhead. She, her, the environment for her is the thing that drives her forward. So because she's so passionate about that, she gets over any you know, nervousness or anxiety she might have about speaking because it is so important to her that you understand what we need to do about the environment. So that passion takes her over the anxiety or the nervousness. And for young women who are trying to work out what it is they care about, there's a couple of things they need to do. They need to flex the muscle in terms of using the voice originally. And then, of course, they have to work at finding out what it is they really care about and what they're passionate about. But if you to get over the anxiety when it is when I'm going to say to you, get up and do that debate, you know, volunteer to be in the school play, get up in the concert and, 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 and play your instrument and don't be nervous about it because you need to learn how to actually show what it is you've got. And, you know, in order to find that, voice, as I said, it's a muscle, you have to practice it, and you have to flex it, you have to use the opportunity. Um, for older women who uh, find themselves, maybe as I did, at home with kids for a number of years, and you might have been a very feisty young teenager and, and had that clear voice in your head, but then you spend time at home with your children and sometimes you lose that voice a little. And I, I will often hear about women who say they stood up for the first time in a school hall or a parish hall to make a point and they were like dying with nervousness because they'd got out of the experience of, of using their voice. But the thing that carried them over again was we desperately need this extension onto the school so I have to stand up and passionately explain to people why it is we need it. And their drive to actually explain that, putting the other person first, gets you over the anxiety. So if you always put your audience first, you've no time to be wondering, how do I sound? How do I look? Do they like me? Am I doing okay? If that's the only little voice you're listening to, you're going to be nervous because you have that big spotlight facing in here. Whereas if you turn it around and say, I've really got to make this audience understand what it is I'm, I'm caring about, that takes you forward, if that makes sense. And I'd love our young women to Keep that voice, whatever it is. There's a, there's a lot of science around this where young girls, 12, 13, you know, before puberty, 10, 11, they're out there on the, the, the GAA pitch and they're competing level pegging with the boys. And then something happens around puberty, 13 or 14, when they look around and they see every poster, every magazine, every online piece, women's bodies, women's parts, our arms, our legs, our faces are used to sell products. And that is the kind of commoditization of women. And that has an effect sometimes of silencing young women a little bit. And they go a little bit quieter in class and they go a little bit quieter at home. And they're trying to work out where they are in the world. And I think that's something we have to be aware of and get over that. And the way you get over that is by volunteering and putting your hand up and taking part in stuff. And, and really trying to develop your opinions. D does that make sense? 100%. And actually, I think Greta Thunberg is a great example. And I use it in schools all the time. I talk about Greta because when I was young and in school, I thought that if you were entitled to opinion and if you were to have a platform, you would have to be male, educated, of a certain age, probably wear a suit, carry a briefcase, and, you know, what Greta Thunberg has shown me and all of us is that you can have a voice at any age, even if it's within your classroom or within your school or within your community or at home, that, you know, if you have an opinion, you're entitled to be heard. And if there's something you need, you're entitled to be heard. So, like, yeah. I completely agree with what you're saying and think I definitely th I knew we were going to be on the same page anyway, but I think we're, we're closer than we thought. I love this idea of um, and, and again, to the young women participating today, working out what your opinions are. And I, I really want you to think about that, working out what your opinions are and why you have them. So pick anything. Michal Martin is the Taoiseach. Do you like him as a Taoiseach? Do you think he's doing a good job? If you do, I want to hear from you. Yes, I think he's a good Taoiseach and he's doing a good job for the following reasons. Now, if you have three good reasons, I can't argue with you. You're entitled to your opinion and you've just given me three good reasons. Or if you equally want to say, no, I don't think he's doing as well as the previous Taoiseach did, or I think he could do more in the following areas, A, B and C, 
then I have to listen to you because you have validated and you have given me a re something to think about. And now we're having a discussion that's based on the facts. It's not about me not liking you because you have a different opinion to me. You were just discussing the issue. We put the issue on the table and we're discussing the issue and we're backing it up with strong references and strong facts. So anytime you put your hand up, as I'm asking you to do in the class and say, I disagree with the way the government is doing the rollout of the vaccinations or whatever it might be. But your teacher, and I do, and life does and society does, want you to have a reason why you think that. Just don't say, I don't like that. Tell me why you don't like it. And that's where you have to find your voice. My own daughter is now 22 and she's in um, fourth year in Trinity. When she was a little girl and her friends used to come around the house, I was the mad mammy who was always asking them their opinions. <laughs> and when they expressed an opinion, any of the little girls, I'd say, why? Why do you think that? Tell me why you think that. They'd be going, oh, <laughs> I really wanted them just to own their opinions and stand over them and defend them. And it was funny, as I said, I was this mad mammy who was always asking them why or what they thought of various things that were going on in the world. Yeah, and I bet you learned from them from time to time. Um, totally. Well. <laughs> Your eyes are opened by, by what they experience and what their lives are and what their views are. It's, it's absolutely wonderful, yeah. Yeah. Now, I want you to talk to me about confidence, because as I get older, I get more and more achievements and opportunities under my belt. You know, I've 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 worked in an organization where I get to speak out all the time and yet I still struggle with my confidence from time to time. And it actually threatens sometimes to stop me from doing things that I'm really looking forward to or I'm really excited about or really big opportunities because Sometimes I think there's somebody better than me to do it or that I might do a good job or that, you know, I let people down. So can you please help me with that and give me some advice? Um, you know, that is fascinating you say that um, because, Tammy, you come across as such a confident together woman and you have founded this brilliant organization, Shona. And the girls who are part of this program would say, how can she possibly say she's not confident because they perceive you as being so confident and, and perception is a huge part of it. But I suppose we have to look at where confidence comes from, where that little voice in your head tells you you're probably able to do this. And if you think you probably can, you probably can. But it comes from sometimes I say it comes from a key influencer in your life. And I do a lot of work with business women or women going forward for politics. And again, it's finding the confidence to do that. And we need to look at, we sort of explore where confidence comes from. And I ask them to go back to their childhood and to find a moment, a bit like that one I told you about in that debate, in that moment, I knew I could speak because I was pushing myself to do it. I was feeling the fear and doing it anyway. It's the gap between that place where we push ourselves outside our comfort zone and we achieve something that's where learning occurs learning occurs in that gap if we always sit quietly at the back of the class we're never going to actually find what we're capable of we have to push ourselves a bit to find our capability but the the, the confidence and the early influencer it could be your teacher it could be your mother it could be a lovely neighbor it could be your aunt it could be a friend who is it the person who tells you do you know, you're great at English. You could be a journalist someday. Or do you know, you're brilliant at maths. I think, you know, you could be an engineer. And they spot something in you and, they, and you go, am I? Am I good? Yeah, right. I need to start thinking about that. And, and for older women particularly, I ask them to look back and access that voice of that person who believed in them. And we do a whole exercise around goals and setting your strategies and what you're trying to achieve and wondering can you achieve it and then you put yourself in the shoes and the voice of that person who was such an influence on you in your early days and it's really it's wonderful when I'm in a room full of women doing this and at the end of the morning they have this voice going yes you can do it I know you can do it I've always believed in you and they hear that person so strongly telling them go ahead and do this because you're well capable. It's a, it's a really wonderful exercise. But for younger women, I'd like you to really think about those teachers who have said to you, do you know, you're quite good at that. Or, you know, the, as I said, the neighbor, the friend, your godmother, who is that person? And go and have a chat with them 
and say, why is it you think I'm, I'm good at music? Or why is it you think I'm good at my art? Or, or what is it I'm good at? Or what is it you see? Tell me a little bit more about that. Help me understand it so I can develop it. And the person will only be thrilled that you ask them because people love giving advice and they'd love to point out to you what it is and just hold on to that and remember it and build on it because that is where your confidence is going to come from as you go older. That sense that you can achieve something because somebody else has seen it in you. And, and you have to learn how to see these things in yourself and not wait to be told. Um, again, using the political analogy, an awful lot of um, women who've gone forward in politics, and we've seen a lot of women emerge in recent times, it's because somebody else in the party said, why don't you put yourself forward as the candidate rather than being the person who is the advisor or the background person? And, you know, a lot of the advice we're giving people is don't wait for somebody else to spot it in you, spot it in yourself. So what I'm saying is a bit counterintuitive, but I want you to think about what other people see and then that perception, because the perception might be very different to how you see yourself. But also look at how you can actually um, build your own sense of what it is you want to achieve. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I just want to quickly mention mentors, because, again, when you get into the business world, you hear of women getting mentors. And, you know, again, because of the work that I do, I always think, oh, if young women had more mentors and it sounds like a very businessy term. But do you think that girls should try and identify mentors and how would they go about that? And what is a mentor? How can how can they help young women? Absolutely. Absolutely. Whatever that first role is. Um, even as you go through college, as you but that first role and that first job you get um, to find somebody who will open doors for you, point things out to you, give you a steer is the most valuable thing you can have at the start of your career. I was doing a training program um, recently with a bank and there was a large intake of young graduates and the HR person that I was working at was so impressed that three or four of the young women had only just started young graduates, first job, a couple of weeks on the job, and came to her and said, will you appoint a mentor for me, please? Because I really want to plan my career properly. And she was so chuffed because she said, young men used to always come and do that. And the women didn't. They just got their head down and worked really, really hard. But here out of this intake were three or four young women coming to her and saying, appoint a mentor to me because I really want to work this thing out and do well. And she was so chuffed and she said, it's beginning to happen. Women are beginning to realize you have to start being a bit strategic and planning where you want to go. It's not enough to just put your head down and work really hard and hope that's going to be noticed. You've also got to work out how things work around the place. Um, in early career stages, people often will say to me, young women will say, I don't do politics. I just get my head down and do the work and I don't do politics. And I say to them, you have to do politics. Politics is not a dirty word. All politics is, is understanding the sources and uses of power. That's what it is. So when you join a new business and you're that young graduate in your first job, you've got to understand the sources and uses of power. Who's actually pulling the strings around here? How do things work around here? And a mentor is the best person to help you understand all of that, because that's slightly apart from the actual work on your desk that you've got to get through in that particular day. There's a bigger picture and it's to understand the bigger picture. Yeah. And I've been in a lot of schools all over Ireland where there's a lot of politics at play as well. Yeah. Um, so it happens in every environment. Um, can we talk a bit about communication? Because we get a lot of you know messages from girls who you know, they might have fallen in love for the first time or they might be struggling to deal with, you know, situations at home or, you know, trying to find work or speak up for themselves in, in any way. And communication is so important to friendships, relationships, uh, schools, partners, parents, all of that. So what what are the biggest mistakes that we make when it comes to communication with each other? I think not being honest. I think that's the biggest the biggest hold back. Um, not being direct, not being true to ourselves. Uh, it doesn't matter what the communication environment is, um, you know, whether it's a high level meeting or uh, a conversation between two friends or a conversation in a family. Um, you know, we often have those conversations where a lot of words were spoken, but there was very little meaning. And you go out the door afterwards and you say, what was that about? Because there were kind of things going this way and this way and nothing was really connecting. So I think um, honesty 
is a huge skill. Listening is one of the biggest, biggest parts of communication, trying to understand each other. Um, and as a parent, you know, as my kids moved from teens into young adults, I mean, m my relationship with them had to change. And as a mum, you, you kind of fall back into the role of, here's what you need to do, and out comes the finger. And I realized this was never gonna go anywhere with my young adults. I had to just stop and learn to listen to them. So my key way of dealing with my young adults now, I try, is to have a coaching conversation, which is to ask lots of questions, not to, offer opinions unless I'm asked but to allow them to tease out what it is they're trying to work out so we had a big example of that in our own house where one of my sons was doing law and he'd wanted to do nothing but law since he was 10 years old and then it wasn't it just wasn't right for him it just as he was in it I think he was in year two doing fine getting his exams but it just was not sitting with him it was the wrong place and he came home to tell us about that and I realized in the old my old way of reacting would have been what what what's going on what's this about and we had this conversation where we just listened why are you feeling this way what do you think is going wrong what's going right for you what did you like about it what did you not like about it and as he explained it all through i said he knows his mind he knows what he's doing here he's made his mind up and that's fine and it sat much better with us because we took that attitude and that was the real learning point for me i said i've matured as a parent i've got this finally <laughs> because we understood that that was important to him so i think um you know in any communication listen ask questions a lot hear what the other person is saying and be honest there's a great technique as well if you're having any kind of a emotionally heightened conversation with your mom or with your best friend or with whoever and you know to ask those few questions like what's going on for you what are you feeling what's really happening here and then to reflect back what the person has said so you say so if i understand it mom you get worried when i'm out really late at night so it's really worried that is going on for you and the mother will say yes absolutely that's what it is so because they've been heard it takes all the heat out of it so if we can acknowledge that we've actually listened and heard the other person the heat immediately starts to go out of the discussion and you get to a place where you can now start resolving it so that's really a technique but it takes it takes a lot of practice to get to that point but i would i would honestly ask you to try it it really works yeah my final question for you orla and it's probably the most important one is we often look at people like yourself who would consider to be successful and assume that you know life must have been easy for them to have achieve everything that they've achieved or you know maybe they were lucky and you know you've spoken quite publicly about like major challenges and traumas and and tragedies that you've gone through in your life um and a lot of the girls that are watching this now are really struggling and some of them are in a, quite a dark place and feel hopeless or are are hurting uh what advice do you have for those girls Okay, um, you mentioned the tragedy in my own life and it was when I was very young. Um, my first husband was, I was I married very young, I was only 23 and my first husband was, was diagnosed with a brain tumour and we went through a few, few awful but wonderful years as he struggled with that and he finally passed. And I learned so much from him. I learned from his good humour, from his acceptance um, that that sort of key tenet of life that you can't choose the things that happen to you you can only choose how you react to them so he was going through this awful illness and the tunnel was narrowing and narrowing all the time for him but he chose every day to be very good humored about it and that was a godsend and it, it gave me so much strength and it gave me the strength to carry on and to take my life forward afterwards but I think um we're all going through an awful time at the moment with COVID and there's no way of glossing that over it's very tough on all of us and you know we can choose to be really down and depressed and and upset about it or we can be overwhelmed or we can but we can take a moment out of that no matter how low we are to try and think about somebody else who might be worse off and that's the best technique i think i can give you on the day you're at your worst and your lowest is there some little tiny thing you could do for somebody else because actually it'll take you out of yourself as well and that little thing might be just picking up the phone and phoning your grandmother and say hi gran i was thinking about you are you okay you will make her day 
or it might be you know the neighbor down the road who lives alone and you know go down outside her house and put a sign up outside her window and say can I get you anything in the shops and again you will just make her day and that little thing of getting off the bed and going downstairs and doing that will change how you feel about yourself or it might be a tiny thing you could do for your your family or your mum or whoever go downstairs and clean the kitchen like 10 minutes effort and you you know and you're saying but i'm at my really lowest why are you asking me to do this when i'm at my really lowest because that's the point when you need to do it if you do a small 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 thing for somebody else you feel much better i you mentioned earlier that i juggle a lot of things in my own career and there are days when i can be overwhelmed i can have 20 things on my plate and i have so much to do i don't know which thing to start with and i just do nothing and i'm in a complete funk because i can't get through all of this stuff and that's when I stop and I say, forget all of that. If I do one thing for somebody else, that big pile of work I have won't seem so bad. And it'll be like, it'll be a tiny thing. It'll be a phone call. It'll be a, a little message to somebody. It'll be, you know, a book I promised somebody. I'll just put that book in the post and send it off to them. It'll be just a little thing I do for somebody else. And straight away, my pile doesn't seem such a big pile. Thank you so much, Orla. I love chatting to you. I'd love to chat to you again um, and hopefully real soon. And I know that the girls watching will get an awful lot out of what you said. You feel like everybody's mammy here today. Ah, thank you so much. Thank you for your time, Orla. And please take care. I love what you're doing with the Shona Project. It is absolutely amazing. And your own story and your sister Shona, it's such a beautiful story. And the work you're doing is amazing. And I love the idea of a community for girls, that you can support each other, that you can help each other, that you have each other's back and that you have a resource, a go-to resource like Shona, when you are feeling down, go on there and just read something that cheers you up. And it's 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 brilliant. And well done you, Tammy, and all your team for the great work you're doing. Thanks, Orla. We'll see you really soon. Take care. Bye-bye.